Hello, I'm Scott Brady, publisher of Overland Journal and Expedition Portal. I'm here with Lois Price, famed adventure traveler, and I'm standing next to their 1901 barge from the Netherlands. I'm going to ask her a couple questions about adventure travel. But I know that so many people want to know, how do you go from leaving a desk job at the BBC to traveling around the world? Yeah, that's a good question, because that really did transform my whole life. Um, I was working at the BBC in a regular nine to five. I'd been on a holiday on my motorbike just, just for a few days. And I think everyone knows that feeling of coming home uh, from the holiday or from the bike trip and thinking, oh God, you know, back to work. And, and I think that, that was the moment that I just thought, I simply can't do this anymore. I was in my late twenties. I don't know if that's a classic time for some kind of a crisis. Um, so I was just like, okay, I, there, it's the old cliche. There must be more to life than this. What made you decide to do travel by motorcycle? For me, the motorcycle is a wonderful way to see the world because it engages you with your environment. So you literally, the weather is all in your face. You feel the hot, the cold, the butterflies, you know, you smell everything. And it also, it's a great icebreaker because people always want to come up and talk to you, especially if you're a woman alone. So you make a lot of friends uh, on a motorcycle. So I think it's kind of the best of both worlds. And it means you can cover distance and you've got that kind of excitement of, of you know, going off road or, or the kind of speed thrills of, of being on a motorcycle, which maybe you don't get so much from say walking or cycling. So for me, it was the motorcycle that actually inspired my journeys almost. I'd learnt to ride just for fun, riding around London, but I'd only really ridden in London. But it was that combination of sort of this boring office job and then this motorcycle licence that I just acquired suddenly sent me off on this kind of light bulb moment of like, aha, that's the way to see the world. I'd always had itchy feet. I kind of wanted to travel. I didn't quite know how to do it and I knew I didn't want to go backpacking. Uh, and I knew I wanted my own wheels in some way and so I learned to ride a bike and then that was like the answer and then it all went from there. Yeah, a motorcycle can be such, such a beautiful way to travel because it really simplifies things. I suppose the main takeaway from all of those years of travel that I've done is just take less and less stuff every time. So if you see the pictures of my bike from the first trip and then the next one, you know, you look at the last one and it's so pared down. Uh, so I always wear an open face helmet, which I know a lot of people think is maybe not particularly safe. But for me, a lot of the a lot of the pleasure of motorcycle travel is engaging with people fa face to face, and I think you can really uh, make a big difference if you can smile at somebody mm. in instantly, mm. and certainly in difficult situations like border crossings or the police checkpoints. If you can just smile and say hello in their language. That can diffuse so much rather than turning up with a kind of big black visor. So I'm a big fan of kind of humanizing the experience. So I wear very low key clothing. I wear normal clothes, you might say. I don't wear motorcycle clothes really. So I just wear like regular old leather fry boots, jeans, uh, bell staff, old wax jacket, uh, not from the 70s and, and an open face helmet. So uh, I'm pretty kind of pretty low fi really. Yeah, and, and that's a lot of the fun of it is being able to engage so quickly with people. Yeah. So you come into a village and you can talk to the kids, so it means you're interacting with the locals a lot more. Yeah, I mean, I, I find that it really helps with interacting with the locals. It also, it, I mean, there's an incredible, as you know, camaraderie of motorcyclists around the world. And, and that was just an, an amazing experience for me to tap into that everywhere. Another motorcyclist will, will always stop, always talk to you. Uh, and then the local motorcyclists, of course, they all want to know you. So you instantly tap into this kind of secret world, uh, which I, I found really, really exciting. And I've made so many friends all over the world mm. through, through that. I always carry my camping gear, so I know that no matter where I get stuck, I can always pitch my tent somewhere. Uh, and like you say, you, you have to stop a lot for supplies. You can't carry a lot and you know disappear for, for weeks on end. So you do tend to be going into little villages, cafes. And for me, the human interaction is, is the essence of overland travel. Mm. For those of us that travel, we know that it changes us, oftentimes in profound ways. For you, how has travel changed you personally? Yeah, I agree that it definitely has changed me. It wasn't a sudden thing. I didn't come back from my first trip like, wow, I'm a different person. It's more of a gradual thing. I think the main two th ways that it's changed me, one, it's certainly made me more uh, tolerant of people that are different from me, uh, more interested in people that are different from me, certainly less judgmental, I think. Um, the other way that it's changed me is that I don't worry so much 
I know that everything will work out in the end. Well, as I think before, certainly before my first trip, I used to be lying awake worrying about this, that, what would happen, what about this, what about that. Now I just think, yeah, it'll be fine. And it is, <laughs> that's the amazing thing, it always is. So one of the things we're getting feedback from for more and more of our readers is that they're actually traveling as vegetarians or as vegans, which I think is really an interesting change that we've seen over the last decade. And, it, and it's consistent and you can oftentimes find good ways to travel as a vegetarian or a vegan. How have you found that you were able to do that? I do depend a lot on bread, cheese and tomatoes, uh, which you can get anywhere in the world as I'm sure that you know but I have had difficult situations where because uh, a lot of cultures they don't understand being a vegetarian and so they couldn't really make it out so they would sort of make a big fuss about bringing me some camel or some endangered species in Niger they said oh we killed a gazelle you know which are like endangered species and, and bring it to you and so you, you kind of have to eat it out of politeness because it would be so rude not to so I have eaten some meat sort of really quickly <laughs> then, yeah. but most of the time I manage because you can always find fruit some kind of vegetable um, bread and some kind of cheese even if it is laughing cow <laughs> so we're bringing this interview to a close but I know that there's more to you than just travel so tomorrow you've got what going on well tomorrow yeah I'm playing the banjo with my uh, band the Jolines in central London so shame you can't be there but you go home tomorrow right <laughs> And how long have you been playing the banjo? Oh, probably about seven or eight years now. Oh, fun. Cool. Yeah. And is that something you've been able to bring along with you on any of your travels? Well, it's funny you should say that because we did a, a Ural trip in a, a Ural sidecar from Richmond, Virginia to Seattle. 6,000 miles, it's absolutely brilliant. And yeah, the banjo traveled the, in the sidecar, so. Perfect. Well, <laughs> thank you for being such an inspiration. Oh, thanks it's for having me. And thanks for having me as part of Overland Journal. Yeah, thank you.